Chen left a legacy of incredible depth in Chinese food. I am Joyce Chen, and this is my son, Steven. Hi. Hi. This is my daughter, Helen. Hello. She did cooking classes at the adult education centers in Cambridge and Boston. Then she also opened a restaurant in 1958. Then she wrote a cookbook. Welcome you to our kitchen. And this is a restaurant kitchen. A producer in uh, WGBH was like a customer and asked my mother, like, would you like to do a cooking show? Well, I always think of her as just one of a kind, a pioneer. I traveled the world writing, curious about people and places, hungry for culture and cuisine. Inspired by the uniquely Chinese-American dish General Tso's chicken, this is Soul Food, an American journey through the Chinese kitchen. I'm Gerald Tan. Boston has a knack for transporting one back in time, all the way to the dawn of the American Revolution. One could traverse the chapters of US history via the Freedom Trail, a four-kilometer brick route linking sites seminal in shaping the country's independence. From Faneuil Hall to the Old State House, the city's oldest standing public building, Boston provided a blueprint for what cities could offer in civic life, pioneering a string of firsts in the nation. The first subway system, which grew into the T. The first free municipal library. The first public park, Boston Common. The first police force. Welcome to Boston. I'm here to discover the life of another true original, a trailblazing chef who put Chinese cuisine on the map for so many Americans. Joyce Chen was a feature of the Boston area, not just in her restaurants, but her television show, Julia Child and Joyce Chen, we call them the two JCs, uh, used the same studio at uh, WGBH Television here. <laughs> Today we're going to make lion cat, and it is no lion in it, just largest size meatball cooked with Chinese cabbage. The children Helen and Stephen Chen have invited me over for a cooking lesson as we attempt to follow that very episode of the TV series. Hello, Hello Beth. It's good to meet you. I'm Gerald. Gerald, it's a pleasure. Hi, Gerald. Hi, Beth. Good to finally see you. Thank yes. you so much for having me. Please come in. Thank you. But back in the 60s, it was really, really hard to get some of the ingredients. So we might be just adjusting the recipe a little, tweak it just a little bit to meet what's available now. The first steps are straightforward. Ground pork is seasoned with dark soy sauce, pale dry sherry, brown sugar and cornstarch before being shaped into large orbs and fried. We're going to put it into a casserole dish and we're going to cook it, slow cooking for about an hour. So that an will, hour? Yeah. And this is why you, know, you don't normally see this, this uh, dish on Chinese restaurants. Finally, the mane of the lion. Napa cabbage sliced, sautéed and stewed with the meatballs to soften. Okay. This is, we can tell how talented you are, <laughs> how you stir. Uh-oh. I mean, that's really how you kind of look for a good chef. Very good. Good. <laughs> right. I get a little bit nervous. I'm oh. camera shy. <laughs> Mother, her recipes were always tested and retested, and they always work. What struck me about her show was that it was 30 minutes 
unedited. And back then, there was no music, no fancy graphics. It's black and right. white, and it was her personality that just keeps you enthralled. Right. And this is a very nice Chinese grocery store. We always come here to shopping. To make it a little bit more complicated is that you know, English wasn't my mother's first language. Right. So therefore, um, she it, was, Yeah, she would spell out the words sometimes. Right. Dongguo, the winter melon. Boston bills itself as a city of people, all people, with inclusivity at the forefront. In many ways, the axiom speaks to its legacy of settlement, first with the Puritans from England and the successive tides of migration after. Nearly one-fifth of city residents claim Irish ancestry. The North End neighbourhood is the Italian Quarter, a warren of patina-tinged alleys with old-world smells and sounds. While nearby Chinatown was the first and now last of its kind in New England, the cultural convergence made for a metaphorical melting pot, out of which emerged a culinary peculiarity. There is a special cuisine known as Boston Chinese. Now, one of the features of that would be the inclusion of bread. The chow mein sandwich is a particular Boston food, and yet it originated not in Boston, but in Fall River in New Bedford. Flanked by a harbor and abundant water to power textile mills, Fall River was once a cotton manufacturing center. Today, the picturesque community draws Epicureans from afar, sniffing out Mi Sam Restaurant, the home of the chow mein sandwich. Chow mein sandwich is our local favorite. And it's what it is, is a, in a hamburger bun to start with, and then we throw some uh, crispy fry noodle right here. We go to extra little bit of um, trouble to Heat the noodle nice and crispy. So let them drink. So, and then as your choice, your, what you like, you can have um, pork, you can have ah. chicken, and a shrimp, and beef, right? How about we're gonna mix uh, beef okay. uh, with, with pepper, All right? Now put that on top. Okay, you can leave that on. On here. And then turn on the stove right here. So when they get heat up, Mm. So then you pour it on here. Okay. Right Just over it? Over it, yeah. No. Let's Noodles see. Yes. on bun. Just, yes. Double right. carb. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the noodles start out brittle, but soften once coated and coaxed by generous lashings of gravy. This viscous heap is then topped with a final flourish. Look right here. A little you bonnet know, of a bun. There's some people never never tried before and they actually use the finger to pick up and say no 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 no. It looks like it'll be a big mess. <laughs> you start your fault. Because what why they use uh put a bun on there? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people like just like you eat spaghetti, you you order garlic bread. I never thought about that. Yeah. She and I travelled hundreds of miles mm -hmm. and I waited a very long time to take my first taste of this legendary piece of American history. Okay. Mm. It's kind of incongruent. It's crispy, the noodles, mm -hmm. but it's bathed in this lake of sauce, as you mm -hmm. can see. So it's also soggy in some parts, but also crispy. Punchy, yeah. Punchy, yeah. Uh, people travel from New York one of them from Connecticut, every month, at least twice a week, twice. We had one from Alaska. We had one from Tokyo. And I said, how do you find us? My little tiny place, how can you find us? He said, we look you up in the internet. 
they say the weirdest food in the U.S. map. Mm. That's what they find us. All right. <laughs> Weird, perhaps, but certainly worthy, such that Mi Sam restaurant and its signature dish are part of the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History collection. For a lot of people of Fall River, this is the dish they're very proud of. It's something they grew up with. Right, right. And a lot of um, schools serving chow mein sandwich as lunch in so the it's, menu. It's part of the school lunch system? Yeah. Again, that shows just how integral it is to yeah. this community. Right, right. Alongside the chow mein sandwich, the Boston Chinese table serves up lobster sauce, a gravy of minced pork that's heavy on molasses, an erstwhile Boston export, plus a familiar treat bearing a local moniker coined by none other than Joyce Chen. So this is jiaozi. This is a guo tier. English name, Picking ravioli. Back in the, the 50s, when we first opened our restaurant in 58, people had no idea what dumplings or the pasta were. So she thought, you know, ravioli, because it's, you know, it's your dough on the outside and filling. Filling inside meat and dough. Yeah, and also there's a large Italian population here, so she called it Peking ravioli. You know, my mother introduced it at a time when there were few Chinese living in the United States. Mm -hmm. She brought something from her own background, which is in northern China, mm -hmm. which really was the first introduction yeah. of that. Yeah, well, just like Lion's Lion. Head. Exactly yeah. like Lion's yeah. Head. Exactly. So how did the Chinese all end up here? So it was uh, post-Intercontinental uh, Railroad, and these unemployed laborers were on the West Coast looking for work. Um, a shoe factory here in North Adams, Mass, had a strike, and a recruiter was sent by the shoe factory owner to go pick up some labor to break the strike. So those were our first Chinese immigrants here. neighborhood is quite old. It was in uh, 1806. It was landfilled. It used to be the South Cove of Boston Harbor. This is one of our newest murals. I love it. Um, this is the site of the old Ho Toy Noodle Factory. What are we seeing here? Yes, yeah, so this is a representation of the fortune cookie. Ah! And then coming out of the doors of the noodle factory, we'll follow the noodles oh, down yes. Oxford Street. And this is our oldest street in Chinatown. And then special noodle dishes like wedding noodles with the red dates and okay. the um, goji berries. And then the symbolism it's, you know, is great. It's, it's so beautiful. strong, right? Noodles and how it kind of ties family That's together, right. ties the whole community. That's right. Yes. Yeah, and if you look as it goes down to the middle of the block, these noodles actually tell more stories and then turn into a dragon. I want to take you to Ho Yuan, to my favorite traditional bakery. Josan, Josan. And I will usually get a moon cake. Um, I'm a big fan of the white lotus seed moon cake. Yes. We have um, the coconut buns, okay. which people love. It has a salted coconut paste in the middle, oh, so it's right. like a brioche style uh -huh. bun, yeah. um, and the bolo bao. It looks like pineapple on the top of the bao, but it's actually just a sugar paste that crinkles like the skin of a pineapple when it's baked. Next up on the periphery of Chinatown is Jean's Chinese Flatbread Cafe. A different type of bread here is the centerpiece of a Chinese delicacy that traces its roots to Xi'an, an ancient capital of the Silk Road where East met West. Well, West met East in this bowl of Yang Rou Pao Mo, which was brought to Xi'an by the Tajiks, Central Asian mercenaries fighting for a Tang Dynasty emperor. Jean, 
How did you learn how to make flatbread? From the family, from my parents, uh -huh. from my mom, from my grandma. In Xi'an, Northern China, the people almost, I don't want to see, almost three meals a day eating the noodles and bread. Bread. Not rice. No rice. That's the, that's the area. It's a cold, dry. So don't grow rice. Just wait. The recipe for this bread is as simple as it gets. Flour plus water. No salt, no yeast, so it's unleavened and dense. Ten minutes of vigorous kneading brings the dough together. It's then portioned out. Pulled, shaped into a spiral and flattened. A unique twist which gives the disc its characteristic appearance. Once the flatbread is crisped on the griddle, the real fun begins. Diners are expected to toil for their meal in keeping with tradition. Okay, so for the yang rou pao mo, so we need to break the bread first. Okay. So break to the half. Uh -huh. So we start till then like small pieces. I read that the Xi'an government even put out a circular telling you exactly how big this should be. <laughs> Can you remember eating your very first bowl of Yang Rou Pao Mo? Like maybe two or three. So my grandfather, mm -hmm. you know, one day take me to the restaurant, you know, sitting there to start teaching me. You know, tell me you are one of like a Xi'an people. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing, first technique you need to learn. So <laughs> this, this runs in your blood? Yes. What do you think this dish means to the people of Xi'an? That means... I think mean everything. Mm -hmm. You know, you're hungry, you want Yang Rou Pao Mo. Okay? You have something you need to celebrate with the friend, family, let's go for the <laughs> Yang Rou Pao Mo. <laughs> Jean, this is hard work. We've been <laughs> taking time, taking time. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> do families just get together and start Breaking bread. Yeah, talking, get a part of the hot teas, talk about the family time. You know, in English, we've got the saying, breaking bread. Yeah. This is it. <laughs> the bread, painstakingly pinched, torn and shredded, returns to the kitchen for the final step. A gentle soak in lamb broth that exudes fennel, star anise and cinnamon. Jean, first impressions. This smells utterly heavenly, heavenly. I'm getting whiffs of the lamb. The cilantro has a nice fragrance to it. Garlic bulbs? Yeah, that's the pickled garlic. So I should throw one in? Yeah, just uh, take one, Got put it in the bowl. All right. Okay, don't worry about it to peel the skin. So one thing important to eat the uh, yang rou pao mo, don't mix it. Why not? Well, the heat first. The heat, the is heat escapes. Yes. All right, here goes. Okay. This is my favorite part. Tasting this, it's the perfect meal for a cold day. A cold, rainy, dreary day. This just goes right in and warms your soul. Yes. <laughs> This Chinatown is a core for um, Asians all over New England. And so even people who maybe grew up here and moved out to the suburbs, they come back here for Lunar New Year with their families. They come back here for weddings during the mid-autumn uh, festival. Is Chinatown shrinking? Yeah, I mean, the population is less and less Chinese. We have families here for many generations being squeezed out by rising rents. We have the businesses like the noodle shop I showed you that has got pushed out. And the reality is, you know, it's a city and it's a changing city. If you look at the history of Chinese people and Chinese immigrants particularly, they're incredibly resilient and incredibly resourceful. They will adapt as they always do. So that's been sitting on the stove for quite a while. 
right. Bring it over. So, so it's perfectly braced. And the grand reveal. All right. You ready? Ta da! Yes. Ta -da. <laughs> oh, see, now the cabbage is nicely cooked. And the lion is roaring. The lion is roaring. <laughs> of the meatball itself. The outside is beautifully caramelized and the inside is still you know, really intact but moist. There. So, oh. how is it? <laughs> this is the real deal. Just like mother used to make. Ah. <laughs> and the cookbook, you know, was kind of really cutting edge because she went to so many publishers and no one would publish her cookbook. So then she actually ended up printing the book herself. Your mother was really entrepreneurial in that sense. She really was amazing. I mean, she was fearless. Mm. You know, uh, obviously someone who wouldn't, wouldn't take no for an answer. Fearless entrepreneurship is a common theme in these parts. Cambridge, Massachusetts sits across the Charles River from Boston. Renowned for Harvard University, the oldest U.S. institution of higher learning, plus the neighborhood of Kendall Square. Dubbed the most innovative square mile on the planet, with its concentration of life science companies and laboratories. Sumiao has a menu absolutely demanding sort of deconstruction analysis. It's so fascinating. They talk about regional foods from Hunan, but they also talk about healthy versions. And the brains behind the operations, a pair of medical doctors trained in China. We both uh, came to this country in 1992. Yeah, I was a visiting scholar in Harvard Medical School. And uh, we live in Boston for 30 years now, and also myself, working in this area, Kendall Square, Cambridge, for over 28 years. I always dream of having my own restaurant to introduce my hometown food. So I went to Nicolombro uh, for one year and a half to learn French cuisine. Uh, I just want more understanding of Western food and the drinking culture, and before I introduce my hometown food. What are some of the main characteristics of Hunan cuisine? Hunan province is very famous in spicy food. And that's why you know, this is the, the, the root of the uh, cuisine. I think my favorite dish is um, like steamed egg. Uh -huh. yeah, because so much childhood memory in, from that dish. Steamed egg, it's one of those dishes that can be found across all the regions of China. Yes. It's everywhere. Everywhere. So how is it special here? I think the sauce is very different. Um, we um, put the hul special hulan chili sauce called duo jiao. It's chopped chili sauce and um, very fresh. Chen's training at Le Cordon Bleu and her heritage are expressed elegantly onto the plate. I am going to start with the steamed eggs. Okay. Because there's such an artistry to this. Mm. Okay. Take a look at this. Mm. Uh, you, can, you can see the texture. It's, it's springy, it's spongy, yeah. it's slippery, mm. it's all the essence, right? I'm uh -huh. going to serve you. Oh, thank, thank you, you so You're much. Mm -hmm. How do you get it so smooth and custard like. Mm -hmm. I think it is the recipe, how to uh, make right concentration, how many eggs, uh, put how much water, mm -hmm. and steam how long. That's the uh, three element. Even it's traditional uh, recipe, Sun Miao is trying to bring a lot of a scientific way to standardize the procedures. Right. Yeah. When you're talking about uh, the ingredients, how much, how long to cook, how high the temperatures, 
That's all about science. That's your yes, exactly. Yes, your background. Yes, yes. I'm curious about the okra because okra, from my knowledge, is not something you find in Hunan. Yes, yes, you are right. Absolutely right. But in my hometown, we don't have such vegetable. Uh huh. Yeah, but I found here. I love it, I, and also I I want to cook it in my own way. Thank that you. That becomes a full line authentic dish. That to me is such a reflection of your journey. And then there's this. Tang Yo Baba is a staple snack of Changsha, the capital of Hunan province. Glutinous rice dough is shaped into small squishy pillows, then fried and finally doused in a brown sugar emulsion. Beautiful. Right. <laughs> yeah. Softer, tender. Yeah. The brown sugar. Um, uh, it's very delicate. Yes. Yes. It's very delicate. Yes. It's a mochi ball. Yes. Right? Yes. A mochi ball. Yes. But this is correct. Fragrant. Right. Fragrant because it's caramelly. Uh -huh. So you got that burnt sugar in, infused in the mochi. Uh -huh. mm. Yes. And yes. this dish, would you say that it's mostly all textural? Yes, it's texture. It's That's all secret, about texture, right? it's secret, yeah. Is it surreal now to watch old episodes of your mother? You know, sort of at her heyday, teaching you all this? Well, what I always remember is my mom's voice. Mm -hmm. That's so distinctive. I don't know. I always think of her as just one of a kind. Mm -hmm. A pioneer, definitely a pioneer, because she never really followed anybody. She had her own ideas. They were ahead of her time. She said that, you know, being a cook is an unselfish artist. Because what happens is when you cook, you don't really cook for yourself. You cook to, for other people to enjoy too. In 2014, the U.S. Postal Service immortalized Joyce Chen with her very own stamp, the honor for revolutionizing the nation's understanding of food. It was a philosophy that Chen held on to throughout her illustrious and groundbreaking career. This is our, really our purpose. We want to represent the Chinese food and the Chinese culture in a very honest way. Yeah. History is a curious thing. Boston may be awash with vestiges of a bygone time, the cobbled streets and verdant promenades, storied colonial taverns and a ballpark celebrated as America's oldest. But this is no city tethered to its past. Bostonians have continually defied and defined conventions, flipping the script on status quo while forging paths for what can and should be, much like the cooks changing notions of what we eat. Whether it's brand new or the familiar with more flair, the marriage of nostalgia and novelty, the old world meets modern Boston.